it's been a minute. Jasmine here, and I just wanted to highlight a few changes that you probably already noticed. This channel has now been renamed to the Holy Poison Vlog. As the heart of Holy Poison had always been music, now there's the HPZN Music Channel, and you can subscribe there and get all of the latest information on new Christian artists, old Christian artists, and surprises here in the next couple weeks. So Adonai Tech is where you can subscribe and find out more about the different tech being developed out in our society. Anything from healthcare to defense technology, um, even um, aerospace and space technology. And that is a great place to kick off today's eschatology video. The Bible does particularly mentioned several the signs in the sky and those sort of things that you will see in the end. Last time was a compilation of um, different visions and dreams that people were having about the end times and many of those people mentioned the stars falling from the sky kind of as the sign of the end. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the celestial powers will be shaken. In Revelation chapter 6 in verse 12 it says, Then I saw him open the sixth seal. A violent earthquake occurred. The sun turned black like sackcloth and the entire moon became like blood. The stars of heaven fell to earth as a fig drops its unripe figs when shaken by high wind. The sky separated like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was moved from its place. If this is the creator of the universe, if he wants stars to fall out of the sky, he could very well make stars fall out of the sky and that's not gonna be much of a challenge for him. But again, would there be other things that maybe John is seeing in this vision that he thinks are stars that are falling? What would that look like and, and how could that happen? Does that seem to match scripture of what is being described in the end? Currently, there are over 5,000 satellites in orbit. That number is expected to at least double by the year 2025. And that doesn't include all of the 12,000 satellites that SpaceX's Starlink program plans to launch by 2027. As of early October, SpaceX has launched more than 700 satellites into orbit. So, nearly 20,000 satellites in space by the end of the decade? What would happen if they all came crashing down? That's only a few chunks of satellites coming in our direction. If 20,000 satellites came heading for Earth, you'd definitely notice it. Lots of satellites are nuclear powered and there's a chance that when they come crashing down to Earth, they could still be radioactive causing even more harm to the planet after they hit it. Luckily, the chances of something like this happening are incredibly low. The only real possibility of it happening would be if Earth were hit by a solar storm. And if that were to happen, falling satellites would be the least of our worries. But that sounds like a story for another. What if? One of the things that is really interesting about our current generation and our era of time, time is we're seeing this massive new space race emerging, whether that's due to the development of new space weaponry. Tonight, new concerns inside the U.S. defense community over a Russian military satellite exhibiting some very strange behavior. Our Brian Todd is on the story for us. Brian, why are officials keeping an eye on this particular piece of equipment? It's very interesting or people making an attempt to mine valuable metal that is out in space that maybe we don't have access to in those quantities here on Earth. Let's not forget, scientists have discovered an enormous cosmic diamond named BPM 37093, which is a crystallized white dwarf star. Basically, it's a diamond 4,000 meters long. But he made a speech a few years ago that we're going to send and astronauts, astronauts to, to an asteroid. asteroid. If we're seeing this massive space race and what that is creating is this massive influx of things up in space. What goes up must come down eventually, that's what they say. It's actually really pretty amazing stuff. When God came down to look and see what humanity was doing with the Tower of Babel, he was like, 
anything they put their mind to, they're actually going to be able to achieve. So I'm going to confuse their language. Like, it just wasn't time for that. But now we're in an era where anything we put our minds to, we can do. God clearly created us with that ability. But I think where people are getting it wrong right now is that they are trying to be the creator and they're trying to be God. That's a story for another day. And so the way our earth is set up, we're kind of in a unique position right now because we really, for the first time, are in a, in a place where we could see some sort of catastrophic event that could occur that would make it seem and feel like all of the stars are falling from the sky. In Revelation 7, 1, it says, After this, I saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, restraining the four winds of the earth, so that no wind could blow on the earth, nor on the sea, or on any tree. Vaughn is doing his best to explain this vision that he's getting, getting from Jesus about signs of the very, very last part of I guess humanity's existence and he sees um, these angels standing flat earthers and square earthers and all that can debate the terminology he says four corners of the earth but basically he's saying that he's seeing angels preventing wind from happening on the earth and so what is the angel standing there going to do to prevent wind like where does wind come from the real wind doesn't come from a fan no, in nature, wind is caused by the heat from the sun and the rotation of the earth. That's what makes these intricate patterns of clouds that we see on this photo from space. It works something like this. So essentially, these angels are going to be positioned to prevent the earth from turning. What does that look like? Johnny Basha via Twitter wants to know, what would happen if the earth stopped rotating for a second? Oh yeah, that would be disastrous, disastrous. There are two different scenarios. If the earth just stopped spinning, but wasn't tidal locked to the sun, the planet would experience six months of sunlight and six months of darkness. We are all moving with the earth at 800 miles an hour. Do east because earth is rotating if you stopped earth and you weren't seat belt buckled to the earth you would fall over and roll 800 miles an hour due east imagine everything suddenly moving across the planet at 1000 miles per hour it wouldn't matter what it was everything would experience a sideways deceleration of three quarters of the earth's gravity suddenly down would be at an angle of 38 degrees from vertical the force of suddenly stopping would rip buildings right off their foundations and send them flying across the ground with anything else that isn't solid bedrock, destroying everything in a giant and deadly debris path. But that's not all. This would also include the oceans, which would suddenly slosh sideways across the planet, with waves being miles and miles high, moving at the same velocity. Imagine tsunamis so high, you couldn't see the top, just a wall of water racing towards you at 1,000 miles per hour. Both of these two calamities would be the end of most life as we know it. The inner core of the Earth is spinning at a faster rate. Just because the surface has slowed down doesn't mean the core of the Earth has stopped too. Our highly volcanic planet might erupt in ways we never imagined. As the tectonic forces above and below enter into a new conflict, supervolcanoes would likely erupt across the entire planet. Our tidally locked Earth would have half of the planet always facing the sun, and the other half would be in permanent darkness. Currently, our planet is in what is called a Goldilocks zone, or habitable zone, where it is the perfect distance from our sun in order to support life. There might still be places on Earth where the climate would be habitable, but on the two extreme sides, it might prove difficult for life to survive, assuming that anything survived the previous catastrophes. If there were any appreciable amount of life left on the surface of the planet, it would now have to survive in the twilight strip of land between the two halves. Normal weathering regulates the climate on the Earth, but now that you have one side of the planet hotter and another side cooler, clouds of gas could significantly increase the temperature so that the oceans would boil, much like what has happened to Venus. The middle of the planet facing the sun on its equator, or the substellar point, would end up so hot that almost nothing could survive. The cold side of the planet, on the other hand, would have a different situation. The loss of the sun's heat on the dark side of the Earth would turn the atmosphere into a dense gas, 
then condense into a liquid, and then further condense into solid ice. Of course, it is doubtful that the atmosphere on the dark side of the planet would turn into a solid form. It might be possible that the atmosphere would make the planet livable, but the storms that would come from this exchange of hot and cold air would be unimaginable. There would be superstorms on both sides of the planet, with wind being strong enough to strip the very rock and erode it into sand. The next thing that would likely happen is that the magnetic field of the Earth would stop regenerating and slowly decay over time. The reason for this is because the magnetic field of the Earth is generated by a dynamo effect that involves its rotation. Our magnetic field plays a huge role in keeping our atmosphere intact, and this magnetic field also protects the Earth from cosmic rays. Where would this leave humanity? We would be able to control our environment to a degree by moving underground, but growing food in such conditions may be difficult. However, you shouldn't worry about this happening anytime soon. That would just be a bad day on Earth. I'm just saying. <laughs> Science aligns very closely with the visions that John is seeing. And so what I want to do now is I want to give you the reasons why I personally believe that the church is not going to go through the tribulation period. The first reason is a pretty simple one, and that is the idea that the word church does not appear in the book of Revelation from chapters 4 all the way through chapter 19. You notice chapter 4, and specifically in chapter 6, when all of the events of the tribulation begin to occur, the church is nowhere mentioned again until we see the church in uh, chapter 19. And even there, we see the church not suffering but celebrating because there is going to be a uniting between us and Jesus Christ forevermore. The second reason is that I believe that the Bible is crystal clear that God is not going to allow his church, his believers, his bride if you will, to experience divine wrath for no reason. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also, here it is, keep you from, not in, or not during, but keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Then Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. But for the second coming, Jesus comes with his saints to rule and reign with us for a thousand years on the earth. That's all we've got for this time. Hope you enjoyed it. Don't be afraid to like, share, subscribe, as well as subscribing to Adonai Tech or HPZN Music, and I'll link those below. Comment, let me know what you think. I guess we'll have to see where it takes us next.